All right, Trump Week. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. Every Wednesday we do Trump Week, and we call this show the big week for Trump Week. Namely, that uh, there's a lot of material to cover. Uh, so I'm remote today, and so is Tim Apicella. Uh, Tim is, in fact, in Tahiti, uh, and he's by uh, by phone, uh, and I, I want to say hi to him, and thanks for the effort of making the connection from Tahiti. Hey, good afternoon, Jay. Appreciate it very much, and I'm um, glad to be here, and what a day. What a day we just witnessed with the vote, and um, lots to talk about. Yeah, a lot has happened since our last Trump week. I guess we should talk first about, you know, the most recent things, but we have a... We have miles to go here, uh, so let's let's talk about um, uh, G. Let's talk about the um, uh, the State of the Union last night. Uh, what did you think about it? Well, Donald Trump was the ringmaster. Donald Trump got exactly what he wanted. He wanted this reality TV show to play, and he wanted to play for the introduction for the 2020 election. He used the State of the Union, a very kind of solemn occasion, for his campaign kickoff. And, um, boy, was it a kickoff. It was like a rally. It was like a campaign was rally it? where everybody went wild, at least on the left side, the right side of the aisle. Uh, the Republicans were cheering every single sentence. I've never seen that before. And certainly Congress has never seen that before. They stood up and gave him a standing ovation every time he finished a sentence, any sentence. What was remarkable about it was that these sentences were lies or exaggerations right on through for a 78-minute speech. Extraordinary how many lies. He added to his quota yesterday in remarkable terms and told us more fibs than you could ever imagine. Um, I guess that's what happens with him. He can't help himself. What's more important is that he be a showmaster, a ringmaster, and run for office and, and fool everybody. You know, it reminds me of Huey Long. He's fooling at least some of the people all the time. Well, were there any notable statements that he made that are worth mentioning, Tim? Well, of course. Well, first off, before I talk about the, the statements, let's look at the action. What was the action? What was the show? What was the reality show that he portrayed? Well, number one, he gave that girl a scholarship. I mean, it's almost like watching an Oprah Winfrey show. Um, you know, everyone gets something, uh, you know, out of this, this game show. Number two is um, he awarded Rush Limbaugh a Medal of Freedom. Um, Rush, Rush Limbaugh is really a shock jock. He, you know, that's what he has been for all these years. And he's been, you know, I'm sorry, but he's been fast and loose with the truth. And if you remember, Rush Limbaugh was the very person who was after the birther movement. Okay. Uh, this is Black History Month. Um, the birther movement and the Medal of Freedom for Rush Limbaugh seems to be at odds with one another. Um, he also, um, you know, he, he, he talked about the military officer with his family, that reunion. Um, that was strictly out of a, a game show, um, salacious kind of, let's get the, uh, let's get the point on, on the viewership here and let's see what we do with that. I'm sorry, but it was just too much. It was too much for me. It was all props. Then there was the, Tus the black Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, who was 100 years old, who he promoted to general right there. Uh, that was really kind of gross, I think. Uh, a lot of drama, a lot of uh, reality show. In fact, the whole thing was a show. And so, uh, but, but people loved it. They loved it. And Republicans came in, you know, carloads of, uh, you know, compliments. And, and uh, they agreed with everything he said. And they applauded everything he said. It was really remarkable. And it's just right in the middle um, an impeachment right in the middle, and that goes on. And P.S. Did he mention the impeachment at all, Tim? No, of course not. And he was told not to. And quite frankly, I didn't think he was going to follow instructions, but he did. You know, the one thing that was missing out of yesterday's um, State of the Union speech was them handing out baskets of bread like they did during the Roman the Roman times during the Gladiator Games. I mean, to keep the masses happy. I, I, that's the only thing that was missing out of yesterday's show. Um, it was that. It was a show. And it was strictly for his, his base and to keep them, you know, keep them energized and keep them happy and keep them moving forward with the 2020 election. 
it was it was a disgrace as far as I'm concerned. And let's not forget that he did overtly avoid to shake Nancy Pelosi's hand. He did it on purpose. And um, what message does that send? Well, and, and her message back to him was to gift up his speech, which I thought was a pretty clever thing to do. I would have done that. I thought about it. Um, you know, the whole and, and, and the notice that all the women, all the Democrat women, uh, were wearing white. There was a message there, uh, and they were sitting throughout. Uh, only on well, the message. The, the message there was uh, was the hundredth anniversary of the the right to vote. The so women did wear uh, white on that, and to um, to make that known that women are half the voting population of this country, and Trump should remember that. Well, this was supposed to be a state of the union. For most presidents, uh, it, it has been a statement of union. Uh, this was different in the sense that it was not a state of the union uh, or a statement of the union. Uh, it was a statement of the disunion. This president has been so divisive, even right there in the state of the union, he was divisive uh, by ignoring Nancy Pelosi. Um, and and, it, and it's, um, it's very clear from what happened with the Republicans standing up and applauding everything he said. Uh, that going forward, uh, when they have that election, I think it's today, the vote uh, is, is uh, you know, on the impeachment. There's no way, there's no way uh, that uh, Trump is going to get impeached because he was making his case. This was effectively his testimony about what a great president he was and the country needs him. Uh, there are very few Republican senators that are going to vote against him on this. And he will sweep into an acquittal, don't you think? Well, I, I agree, and I, I, that's why I almost fell out of my chair when I, you know, I, I read and heard the words of Mitt Romney as to why he was going to vote guilty on the abuse of power charge, uh, the impeachment charge against Donald Trump. Um, and he basically said the following, guilty of an appalling abuse of public trust. And he said, uh, you know, I'm a very religious man, and therefore I'm, I'm voting my conscience, my religious conscience. Uh, but he did cite three reasons why the, he didn't agree with his fellow Republicans. And the first three reasons was that the number one reason that the Republicans thought that this impeachment was invalid is was because there was no statutory crime. Well, we all know that high crimes and misdemeanors does not need to have a statutory crime provision in it. That's not how the Constitution was written. Number two is um, he cited both Joe Biden and um, Hunter Biden as a basis for why this was important, that that should be brought in. But although, you know, maybe Joe Biden overlooked what his son was doing and his son gathering this money, that might not have been appropriate. It certainly wasn't illegal. So that was, you know, he, he, he came out against that argument. And last but not least is... The, the reason not to impeach, according to Republicans, is leave that to the voters. Well, Mitt Romney correctly cited the purpose of the Constitution. That's not the voters' right. That, that's the power of the Senate. That is the provision of the Constitution. And that was the, the power to be exercised at that moment is not to leave this to the voters, but to have the Senate decide. And if those three reasons are why Republicans failed to impeach, they were faulty reasons. And Mitt Romney, I think, accurately described that. Oh, and what did you think of Adam Schiff? I, you know, his closing argument the other day was so good. I said to myself, this is really more than a litigator. He's a philosopher litigator. He's thought it all through. He understands, uh, you know, the nation. He understands the Constitution. He un understands the social science that underlies our democracy. And uh, his, his closing comments were, as all of his comments really throughout the impeachment trial, uh, were so excellent. What did you think, Tim? Well, I'd like to just read a direct quote um, from Adam Schiff because um, it struck my heart. And I think it was dead on. And I think Mitt Romney actually might have listened to Adam Schiff. And Adam, um, Adam Schiff said the following, Truth matters to you. Right matters to you. You are decent. He is not who you are. Is there any one of you who will say enough? And then he followed to say, Every single vote, even a vote by a single member, can change the course of history. It is said that a single man or woman of courage makes a majority. 
is there any one of you who will say enough? So I think Mitt Romney heard those words. And I think that's probably maybe what Mitt Romney was thinking as he decided to take a very unpopular uh, position that he was going to vote against Donald Trump. Mitt Romney will be ostracized, as he mentioned in his speech today. He will be ostracized beyond belief. Yeah, he will. Because that's a, that, that kind of thing. That, that is Trump's calling card. <clears throat> but, you know, um, I, I was so impressed, as you, uh, with Adam Schiff's remarks. They were Shakespearean. They were poetry. And they struck right to the heart of it. He really understands what's happening. And he portrayed that so well. And uh, you'd think that the uh, Republicans would listen more than just Romney, but lots of them would listen. Um, but they didn't listen, and they won't listen. Uh, and they did not listen on the motions, so the eight motions that were made early on at the beginning. They voted as a block against anything the Democrats came up with. Uh, they voted as a block to stop witnesses uh, and uh, to stop any further testimony or document documentary evidence. Extraordinary. Uh, and then they and they did ignore and will ignore um, Adam Schiff's remarks, brilliant remarks. You know, one, one thing, though, and from the part you read, uh, it reminded me of Shakespeare. It was in Julius Caesar, I think, is where, you know, the speaker um, misstates what's really going on. Because he w wants to put it in relief. He wants to show you how absurd it is. You know, he's telling uh, the Republican senators, uh, you know better. You, you are good people. Uh, you, you don't do this. You would not acquit. Uh, you would convict based on the evidence. You would have a fair trial. But they didn't. They haven't. And they won't. And so I think he was, he was maybe appealing to them at some level, but more likely he was just showing that they're not good people, uh, that they're not uh, you know, conscious of constitutional limitations, that they don't understand. That, that was that was really the message. And in that regard, it was Shakespearean what he did. All of his comments were brilliant, but that part really stuck out at me. I, 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 I thought that it was intended to get them to come over, but it had virtually no chance of success. And we'll see, because I think they'll they'll uh, they'll vote, you know, as a block on on acquittal. And you're right. I, I agree that uh, Romney will get will get punished and anybody who votes against Trump will get punished. Because that's what he does. And what we have here is this strange Jonestown, you know, Jim Jones kind of affair where these people, you know, who you would assume are better people are really getting down in the gutter and voting for everything that Trump wants, everything that Trump does. And it's the politics of fear. And it's the politics of irrationality. It's the zombie politics, as one writer called it. Uh, so I'm, you know, I'm wondering what you think, Tim of the, the social psychology involved here. How did he get all these people to vote against those eight motions? How did he get all these people to vote against further evidence was so obvious that that should happen? How did he get them to stand up on every sentence he gave yesterday and to cheer him and, and, uh, and, and send his praises? And how is he getting them to vote right down to, you know, a block again uh, for acquittal. What is it by threat? It by express threat? Are there midnight phone calls? Or is it by implicit threat? Or is um, um, uh, uh, Mitch McConnell uh, calling them in the middle of the night and threatening them uh, in his own way? Uh, do you have any idea about how you could get rational people uh, to do that, to go along with irrationality? How does this happen? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I actually do have some thoughts, and these are the thoughts that we've been talking about since we started Trump Week. Bit by bit, slow, slowly, movement by movement, a violation of this law or that law, slowly, um, he's worked his way up to this point. It just didn't happen with a light switch. He has slowly been eroding their independence of Congress um, with the law and the national emergency uh, you name it, he has slowly eroded their authority, and he's convinced them that whatever he says is the only way, the Trump way, in which to proceed. So I, I do not think this happened all of a sudden. Um, I also think that the threat of him primarying them out, they're concerned for their own jobs. 
their own their own position in the Senate um, has mightily uh, influenced their vote and their ignorance and their ignorance of the Constitution and the rule of law. They don't see that anymore. They have they have walked away from their oath of office, and that's what that's why I shout out to Mitt Romney again is that he he cited his oath, his oath of office, his pledge to God Almighty that he was going to follow the, the Constitution and the preservation of the Constitution. And he cited that specifically in the very first part of his speech. So, you know, Mitt Romney is really a patriot in my mind on this. I know he's going to be, again, he's going to be hated. He's already been disinvited from CPAC, and I guarantee you he would be stripped of every vestige of his office, and he will be despised, and he has another long five years to go as senator. And I guarantee you, Mitt Romney, and he well knew this, will bear the slings and arrows of, out, you know, of Trump's outrageousness. And I it's sad. It's again reminded of the Enabling Act of 1933, where Adolf Hitler got the Reichstag, both houses, to vote a majority or better, to allow him to make all the legislation going forward. Um, how far are we away from that now? These guys would find, will, will follow Trump anywhere on any issue uh, again and again and again. They, they, the Senate has surrendered any discretion they might have had. And as you say, they have completely breached their oath of office and, and violated the Constitution in the, in the, in the process. So, um, you know, how different is that? We, well, we have an emerging dictator now because as so many commentators have said, if he is acquitted, it is, it is flat out encouragement for him to do the same thing again. There was a discussion this morning in the Times, I think it was, uh, where you know some, some Republican senators have said, he understands, he won't do it again. Uh, the impeachment itself was enough to dissuade him from doing it again. You can fool me on that. I think he, the impeachment and the acquittal is a clear message to him that it's fine to do it again, do it all the time, because it's been found legal. Uh, you know, whatever, whatever happened here, uh, has been found legal, and sure enough, in the way of good uh, uh, good pathology, uh, Trump's the kind of guy who's encouraged by this, and will do it again, and worse. And so between now and November, you can watch for it, because it'll happen again and again and again, and it will affect the election. But let's move on to the election for a moment. You know, at the same time he was making his uh, you know, remarks in the State of the Union, Iowa was coming apart. Did you care to comment about that, Tim? Well, this was Donald Trump's dream come true. Because what he's going to do is say, let's say uh, six months from now, the polling numbers are showing Trump not as uh, high as he would like. Or he's going to show that, you know, he's losing. He's going to start using that rig election uh, mantra, as he did in 2016. And what perfect time now to use as evidence that elections are rigged by the Democrats because in Iowa, it happened. That's the conspiracy theory that he's going to throw out there. And I, now you have a perfect example of how that could be happening. Because right now, people don't really know what happened. Uh, they were given an explanation that it was a, a technological glitch. But again, the conspiracy theories always have something better than that. And in this case, they just say it was an effort to uh, push, you know, Joe Biden out or... Who knows? But the bottom line is Donald Trump will make great hay out of that. Uh, well, we, we certainly moved ahead on that in, in terms of uh, a mess by the Democrats. Uh, uh, but then, you know, the Democrats, are, they're a statement of democracy. You know, what did uh, De Tocqueville say? That, you know, d democracy is tumultuous. And certainly we have plenty of that. Iowa was tumultuous. Whatever the reasons were, the fact is they, they couldn't handle it. And, the newspapers are, are now saying they should not be treated as a, uh, a leader and a, an exemplar uh, in these uh, in these uh, caucuses uh, for purposes of uh, selecting a candidate. And I and I would agree with that. Uh, both yeah. Iowa and New Hampshire are small. They neither one of them have big cities. Neither one of them represent modern America in terms of its diversity. Uh, let's move on from that. This was not a good experience for the Democrats or for the country. Uh, and if you were beginning to lose confidence in the Democrats or the country, this would enhance that and it would certainly work in Donald Trump's favor. And here it is now. Today is already Wednesday. 
that election was held Monday night. We still don't know for sure all of the ballots cast and, and who actually totally won in terms of the results. It's unbelievable. Um, and I, you know, they can blame the app or the, the programmers who, uh, you know, who uh, programmed the app, who, who are probably uh, headed to faraway places right now. Um, but, but the fact is it happened, and it is a bad statement about how things work in Democratic uh, primaries in court. Of course. Anyway, so um, what happens well, now? What happens now? We, you know, so ultimately it's going to be uh, uh, Bernie uh, or uh, uh, Buttigieg, Buttigieg um, on the top, and I think then we'll go to New Hampshire and see what they think, and then we'll have uh, what is it, uh, the Super Tuesday, whatever, and see what, what a number of other states think, and ultimately we're going to settle on some candidates. A query. Are the likely winners, are the likely candidates from the Democratic side going to be able to beat Trump? Um, because, I mean, take somebody you can face as a socialist. There's a lot of people in the country are not going to vote for him. Take somebody who is, an, an, you know, a, 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 a gay, a, you know, a, a admitted gay, open, open gay. Uh, a lot of the country is not going to vote for him, even if it's highly qualified. Uh, so, I mean, it doesn't look that good. That democratic, uh, you know, community and field candidates uh, who will beat Trump. What do you think? Well, I think a lot of things. <laughs> uh, well, number one is we could use that argument why Buddha Judge doesn't isn't likely going to be able to make the grade. But I would say the same thing about Barack Obama. I, I really don't think that a lot of people thought of. of an African American could become president of the United States, and he did. And I, I like the judge. I think he would make a great president. He's a little young, um, probably lacking a little bit of the more national experience. But the bottom line is, he's smart. He he knows how to bring people together. He's not divisive like Donald Trump. I think people are starving for that. They're tired of the polarization, and I think the judge could possibly do that. As you stated, though, he has. He has admitted that he's gay and he's living, he's, he's married to another man. And, you know, middle America, conservative America, um, they may have a real problem with that. But guess what? Conservative America, middle America, also had an issue with Barack Obama. And he was elected president of the United States. So there's always the chance that this can happen. I, you know, again, we'll see how the polls go in the future. Just one note about the Iowa caucus, though. Um, this wasn't about the popular vote, and but it does did an excellent job of gathering those delegates. And those delegates, he got, you know, persuaded to come to his side. Uh, CNN only shows it as a percentage of votes and the count of the votes coming in. Those are two different things. So I think Buddha Judge really did a great job in his, his on the on the ground game, and he did well, and it shows in his his numbers. Well, I saw him last night on, uh, you know, one of the channels, and they asked him, um, you know, what do you, what do you, what do you think about what happened in Iowa? And his answer was masterful. It was careful. It was diplomatic. Uh, you know, because the, the full vote's not in. Um, it was, uh, it was, it was a certain modesty to it, uh, and his remarks were poetry. Uh, it was really good copy, and it was off the cuff. Uh, not like Trump reading, you know, 78 minutes of of, uh, of a teleprompter. Um, Buttigieg is really, really smart, and he's really articulate, and he's consistent, and he's honest. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the bright side of this is if a guy like that gets the candidacy, uh, then maybe we all get around him. Maybe we get over the gay thing. Uh, maybe we get around him, and he becomes a kind of JFK or uh, an Obama, and everyone follows him because he is obviously a noble individual, uh, and he has vision, and he is, as you said, he is a uniter, not a divider. So maybe, maybe the good news is that this is all this all this bashing between, um, you know, the the various contenders, democratic contenders, uh, is destructive for now. When it gets resolved, and there is a candidate, and I hope that's soon. Uh, you know, we can we, maybe we can find our way to all get together and support that candidate and have a real election instead of a, a Trump runaway. But, you know, 
Trump is going to, as we said before, Trump is going to try every dirty trick. He now is liberated. And he's, he can get uh, Putin, he can get anyone he wants in the world, any country, and force them, you know, using aid and whatnot and, and geopolitical leverage uh, to help him with all kinds of mischief. Um, and I think he's going to do that. Why not? He's, he's liberated. So at the end of the day, um, we can expect more of that. We can expect more of, of Putin's divisive, uh, uh, you know, tweets or, or uh, misinformation, disinformation. And we can expect the social media to get right along with it and to republish that stuff. And we can expect all kinds of events that are very divisive. Uh, so at, at the end of the day, I'm very worried about the honesty of the election. And even even without talking about, uh, you know, uh, gerrymandering, without talking about voter suppression, um, which are also factors that are going to play in this election, I'm very worried about misinformation to the people and divisive issues among the people and third parties overseas or in this country uh, spreading the wrong message and confusing everybody, as they certainly are, uh, as the Republican Party would certainly like to see them. Uh, so it's a matter of confusion between now and November. So even if um, the judge or uh, Bernie Sanders uh, you know, comes out with a clear mandate and a clear candidacy uh, query, uh, will they have the opportunity to make their case? Uh, are we going to get through this or not, Tim? We have no choice. <laughs> we must forge ahead. And uh, I think Nancy Pelosi said it best last night. It wasn't just regarding the State of the Union speech by Donald Trump. She stated it really well, and that it was, he shredded the truth, so I shredded the speech. And how long has he been shredding the truth for the last three years? <laughs> So, I, think, I, think, I think Americans, I think most independents, Democrats, some, you know, some Republicans who are fed up with Donald Trump, they're going to see the wisdom of that statement because I think we're all getting tired of his over 6,000 lies. And I think it's up to 6,500 lies. We're tired of it. We're tired of the device of this. We're tired of his grandiose, you know, uh, three-ring circus mastery. We're tired of all these things that Donald Trump has brought to us for the last few years. I think we're looking for a little sanity to be placed back in the office of the President of the United States and the prestige of the office itself. And I think the you know, Buddha judge, um, Klobuchar, Joe Biden, all, you know, any number of candidates, we're going to have to get behind that person and move this forward and beat Donald Trump. You bet. So, uh, okay, so we had we had a very interesting week. We didn't cover everything. There's more to go. But uh, let me just ask you what's going to happen next week. And, and uh, let's assume for the moment, I think it's a good assumption, uh, that he will be acquitted. Um, then he gets back to doing his regular thing. Um, and we, we have that to speculate about. Certainly on Trump week, we'll cover it week to week and connect the dots, dot to dot. But what do you think is going to happen after he's acquitted uh, and as we go forward? There are so many, what do you call it, uh, so many animals in the ring, so many issues in the circus, that it's really hard to pick stuff. But uh, what do you think is going to emerge as, as, uh, his, next, uh, as his next uh, direction? Or direct, direct well, three, three things. Let's, well, let's look at two things for sure. Let's see what this vote, this 53-47 vote to acquit him. Let's see what that does for the senators in the purple state. What kind of fallout are they going to start getting? Um, maybe some of it will be known. Maybe most of it will be unknown. But how is that going to impact their 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 ability with their constituents? That's number one. Number two is what is the long term effect of this vote, this acquittal, that um, affects all senators, Republican senators, and on how they continue to follow or not follow Donald Trump to the very word and letter of what he says shall be. So I, I'm looking to look for those two things as the fallout. And then we'll look at um, how he responds and to see whether or not those Republican senators say, okay, you're, you're crossing the line again, uh, to see if they put any brakes on his unbridled um, progression towards 2020. Yep. Lots to watch, lots to come. 
and we cannot really anticipate or, or predict all that much of it. But we will follow it. We'll follow it next week and the week after. Thank you so much, Tim. Tim Apicella, Trump Week. We'll thank you. We'll thank you, Jay. Aloha, and thanks for having me. Aloha. Aloha. Take care.